Peloton's best offer of the season is here. Get up to $300 off accessories when you purchase a Peloton bike, Bike Plus, or Tread. Choose from a variety of accessories, like our cycling shoes, a heart rate monitor, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. If you've been looking for a sign to join Peloton, this offer gives you everything you need to get going. This limited time offer ends November 28th. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access membership separate. Offer starts November 14th and ends November 28th. Cannot be combined with other offers. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. The Venture X Card from Capital One gives you more of what you love, like premium travel benefits and access to Taylor Swift tickets. Oh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and ten times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. Plus, get access to Taylor Swift The Eras Tour, presented by Capital One. Maybe I'll see you there. The Venture X Card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. Hey everybody, Joel here at the top of the show. Troy and I are off this week for Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. In such situations, we like to air an older episode that we think didn't get the attention that it deserves. Troy's pick for this week is the episode on Henry Guinness. So if you missed that on the the first go around or your new listener, enjoy this Revived Thoughts Selects. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and you are listening to Revive Thoughts. Do you want to know the key to the final perseverance of the saints? Love never fails. I do not mean the love in the bosom of the believer for Jesus, but the love in the bosom of Jesus Christ for the believer. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history in a sermon that they deliver today. We're hearing a sermon from Henry Grattan Guinness. It was preached somewhere in the mid-1800s, and the title of the sermon is called Christian Charity Troy. We uh, we have something a little bit different this episode. I'm, I'm kind of excited. Yeah, so we have a very interesting opportunity. I had no idea that this gentleman uh, existed. So I, Henry Grattan Guinness is new to me, was new to me when I first started doing this, even though during his era, he was really quite famous, quite a well-known name during his time. But if you clicked on this, there's a pretty good chance, listener, you also have never heard of this gentleman. And so while I was doing research on his uh, one of his pages, I saw that he had a living relative, uh, his great-grandson, and that his great-grandson was a Christian apologist, an author, and a speaker. And so I reached out to him. His name is Dr. Oz Guinness. And I was like, oh, this is pretty interesting. And I through uh, his publisher, we got connected, told him, hey, I'd like to do an interview with you talking about your great-grandfather. And so, yeah, Dr. Oz Guinness is the great-grandson of this other gentleman, Henry Grattan Guinness, whose sermon we will listen to. And this was just an exciting opportunity. So I asked him if we could talk about his great-grandfather, if we could uh, discuss a little bit his life, his legacy. And it turned out to be a really great interview. Henry Grattan Guinness is a really interesting person and his sermon on uh, Christian charity that kind of comes back to Christian love, his exposition of 1 Corinthians 13 is really good. So this whole episode, everything about this, I'm very excited about it. It all turned out very, very well. And I think you're going to really enjoy listening to it. So without really any more introduction, we're going to go ahead and jump into this interview that we did with, with Dr. Oz Guinness about his great grandfather. Yeah, so we are on right now with Oz Guinness. He is the great grandson of Henry Grattan Guinness, and he usually went by Henry Grattan, I learned. And Henry Grattan Guinness um, was his great grandfather, and, and he himself is a author, he's a speaker, he talks to audiences about Christianity and apologetics and has a lot to tell us about. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about you know, your relationship with him. Obviously, he was your great-grandfather, um, but you, you, your entire family, in fact, was involved in missions, and you yourself, uh, you know, were, were born, if I recall correctly, in China and were there for the first few years of your life as well. Well, many people associate my family and our name with beer, which, of course, is right, the Guinness Beer and the Book of Records. Okay. But actually, my ancestor, what we call the first Arthur, whose signature's on the back of the beer bottle, he came to faith in Christ through the teaching of John Wesley in the Irish Revival in the 1730s. And he founded the first Sunday school in Ireland, 
and did many, many things that make our firm distinctive, like pay and health care and so on. So there's been a strand of faith very strongly right down through the family on my side. So Henry Grattan, whom you mentioned, was his grandson. I'm descended from the youngest son of Arthur Guinness. And Henry Grattan had three extraordinary periods in his life. The first was revival, the second was missions, and the third was when he was involved in the restoration of the Jews to their homeland in what's now Israel. So he was an extraordinary character and while there have been many biographies of people in our family, the odd thing is that in many ways he's the greatest, but there's no biography of him. Yeah, that was actually something I noticed when I was doing research on this you know, character on this episode to look into his life. He seemed like an absolutely really interesting man. I mean, if I recall correctly, Wikipedia, uh, just, you know, the general Wikipedia article says something to the effect of, like, he's the great evangelist of this great awakening during this time. He helped send many faith missionaries out onto the mission field. And yet, I, I confess, before I ran into one of his sermons, I had not heard of Henry Grattan Guinness. He was not a name that I was that familiar with. And I, I don't want to say I spend all this time, I know all these things about all these great guys, but it is, I mean, this is a podcast where I enjoy church history. This is something I enjoy. And yet he was completely unfamiliar to me. Do you, what, why do you think that is? Why do you think that this particular uh, gentleman has kind of maybe been forgotten? Where, where, what happened to his legacy, if that makes sense? Well, he spanned so many different worlds, but I'm sure it wouldn't have worried him at all because he was doing it for the Lord, not for success or fame or anything like that. But in his time, he was considered, along with Spurgeon and D.L. Moody, one of the three great preachers of the 19th century, and he goes on down the line. He was a friend of Lord Shaftesbury. He was a close friend of William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army. So he was deeply involved, but it did start, as you said, with revival. In the 1859 revival in Ireland, and Ireland was united then, he was the lead preacher at the grand old age of 23. So we have newspaper accounts. This isn't family stories, newspaper accounts of his standing on the top of carriages and speaking to 25,000 or 30,000 without a microphone. And of course, the spirit fell. There was conviction of sin and many people returning to faith in Jesus. For example, in the year after the revival in the north of Ireland, and as I said, Ireland was not a divided country then, there was only one recorded crime in the year after the revival. Wow. You know, the second great period of his life was missions. When he was 30, seven years later after the revival, he met Hudson Taylor and invited Hudson Taylor to his Bible study in Dublin. And Taylor had just been out once to China and was recruiting young people to go with him. Well, half of my great-grandfather's Bible study volunteered to go in that first ship to China. Uh, including my great grandfather and his wife. Wait, wait, wait. So, Perhaps can I? So, were they? They were on that ship, that first ship back that went to, uh, that would go to Shanghai, and then I believe they would end up going to Hangzhou. Is that is that correct? They were there. No, they weren't. And I'm telling you. Oh, okay, I was just curious. <laughs> you jumped ahead. You're right. The ship was the Lammermuir, but when he volunteered to go, Hudson Taylor said to him, "You can't. You're too old at 30." Now, as China in those days was too rugged for a 30-year-old or someone <laughs> older. But Hudson Taylor said to him, you stay and send missionaries out to us. So he went to London and founded in the East End of London because he chose extremely poverty-stricken circumstances because if people had to go to the mission field in Africa or Asia or Latin America, they needed to know what it was to survive in tough times. And if they couldn't survive the East End of London, they probably wouldn't survive inland China. Anyway, he founded the world's first missionary training college in the modern sense. And over the next years, he sent out 1,500 missionaries. And he founded himself wow. three missionary societies. Oh 
So they went to Latin America, they went to Africa, they went to China. His own son, my grandfather, went to China. His daughter, Henry Grattan's daughter, married Hudson Taylor's son. So we're actually linked by marriage to Hudson <laughs> Taylor. So an extraordinary missionary outburst. outburst. But then the last part of his life, he was in Paris in the 1870s when the Franco-Russian War broke out and he lived in the same building as Alfred Dreyfus. You remember the Jewish officer who was court-martialed for uh, treason. It was all bogus. It was anti-Semitism and so on. But anyway, my great-grandfather started to look at the place of Jews in history. And in the 1870s, he wrote a book on Daniel, arguing that in 1917, that would be the special year for the restoration of the Jews to their homeland. Mm -hmm. Now, his book, and he wrote several others in the same thing, it was called The Approaching End of the Age. It was read closely by Lord Balfour, who later wrote the Balfour Declaration. Mm -hmm. And it was read by General Allenby, who was the man who liberated Jerusalem. My great-grandfather actually died in 1910, so he didn't live to see it. But his ideas were behind Herzl and behind the Balfour Declaration and behind the liberation of Jerusalem. We have the family story. A friend of the family, Viscount de Lisle, an officer, when he heard that General Allenby had been seconded from Europe to Cairo, he, uh, Allenby was furious. Cairo was a backwater. And my father, a great-grandfather's friend, said to him, no, you will have the honor of liberating Jerusalem this year. And Allenby said, quite impossible. And uh, my great-grandfather's friend showed him the passage in the book and the reasoning why, and said at the end as they left, Allenby, when you enter Jerusalem, make sure you get off your horse and walk in, because someone far greater than you will walk through those gates one day. And amazingly, on December the 10th, I think it was, Allenby liberated Jerusalem <laughs> wow. and got off his horse and entered Jerusalem through the Jaffa Gate humbly. So my great-grandfather was an extraordinary character. He is. He died during the missionary, you know, the, the Global Missionary Convention in uh, Edinburgh, 1910, the first of the great missionary conferences. And when the news came, the whole audience in Edinburgh stood up and sang the hymn for all the saints who from their labors rest and so on. So he was an extraordinary character. But as you and I said, there's never been a good biography written about yeah. him. So he, he's, a, he's this extraordinary man, had a lot of just really interesting things in his life. And it sounds like, I mean, from all accounts, he was very faithful uh, through all these different trials. Was there anything that, uh, were there any moments of struggles for him? Were there any times where things were particularly hard? Or can you think of any moments in, in his life where, where it, it, he might have, I don't want to say he was doubting or anything, but more just were there, what, were the, what were the hard times like for him? Because we're hearing right now all these incredible successes, but were there moments where, you know, I think of, we compare him to Hudson Taylor. I, I, Hudson Taylor had moments where he was, you know, not very healthy or did not have a lot of money and was just trusting completely in the Lord and faith like that. Are there moments like that in his life that, again, since there's not a biography, they might not be as remembered? Well, I'd mention two. The first was, after the extraordinary events of the revival, and he preached in New England, New York, Philadelphia, and so on, with equally extraordinary results. But some of the Plymouth Brethren, he wasn't a Plymouth brother, but he was close to them, they said to him, well, his power was a humanistic eloquence. And he was very humble, wanted to take that seriously. So he stopped for some years speaking as he normally spoke. And he felt later that that curbed him in the spirit and really it was an extraordinary turning point in his life. Another far deeper event was when he lost two of his children through death, which is also always tragic for a parent, especially uh, his, his youngest daughter. And he was in uh, Australia, I believe in Brisbane, 
And he was down on the beach, really grieving, deeply sorrowful, asking the Lord why. And as he was weeping, an old Aboriginal woman came by, put her hands on his shoulders and comforted him. And he was so deeply helped by this touch. And then a second or two later, looked around and there was no one there. And he always believed after that that the Lord had sent him an angel in the form of an Aboriginal woman, and she was the one who brought him the comfort mm. at his deepest hour. Wow, those are incredible stories too. So one more question, if I can, on uh, on this, this person in history. If he was alive today and he was, you know, let's just say, we'll put him in an imaginary situation. He's speaking to young, uh, young people today, or maybe even people, uh, just anybody today. And they're wanting to grow closer to God. What do you think he would tell them? What would, I don't want to say it's like, what's the secret to having a close relationship with God, but what would, what would be the encouragement he would give to them? You think? Well, you know, you read the Victorians and, their architecture and their clothes and so on, we despise today. But my word, the passion, oh, yeah. the word and the gospel and the enterprise with which they got about it. For example, in the little missionary college I mentioned, they set out a steamer to Africa, but they couldn't send out a steamer. So they sent it out in 600 parts and they got a thousand uh, people, servants, who'd carry the different parts of the steamer on their shoulders for a thousand miles up the river. And then they had to assemble the whole thing in the heat, including riveting. And if they had no spare parts, of course, and all that just to get the, the steamer into the river to float along the navigable parts of the River Congo. And it's just an example of the incredible enterprise, but the passion for the gospel. So today's split between the gospel and social justice. None of that. None of that. As I said, he was a friend of Lord Shaftesbury, the poor man's earl. And whether it was inner city work among the down and outs in the east end of London, or preaching the gospel nightly throughout London, throughout Europe, or throughout the world, you know, that passion for the word, for the gospel, for justice, and that enterprise with which they did everything just puts us to shame. Our generation is pathetic. <laughs> if, you look, if you look at people in America arguing what's an evangelical, my goodness, the pride in the gospel, the unashamed confidence in the gospel is something that was so strong. And our generation is pathetic. By contrast. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree with that. Me and my wife, because my wife runs another show on our platform, Martyrs and Missionaries, and we always are just looking at these people and going, how did they have the time and the day to do all that they did, to travel to the places that they did? But you look at it and you look at their passion and you look at their willingness to sacrifice, and then you look at what we're willing to do, and you just go, yeah, we have a lot a lot to learn from these many men. And that doesn't mean that they don't have flaws. That doesn't mean that there might be areas where they could be wrong, but it's certainly, I, I would, I would say maybe some of us just start some of these great mission organizations and give our lives on the missionary field for 50 years and then maybe come back and we can talk about those flaws. Cause I think too often we're ready to sit in uh, armchairs and theological, you know, faculty rooms and talk about the things, but we didn't do, we, most of us could not sit in the sandals of a lot of these great men, from George Mueller to Hudson Taylor to your great grandfather to uh, Charles Spurgeon, who ran an orphanage on top of preaching. Like so many of these people, just have a deep passion for God's word and a deep passion to go and be the hands of feet. And I think that too often, like you said, we just are more about being the brain than that. So I wanted to move on. So not only did he you know, he did these great things, but your whole family, I mean, if I, if I, you know, read correctly, your, your father and your grandfather were also out on the missionary field, were also doing that kind of work. So how did that uh, transpire? Who, you know, how did that end up in a situation where you're being born and, you know, you're in China when uh, Mao was taking over and all that? Well, other members of the family too, but you haven't time for that. <laughs> My great grandfather's oldest son, Harry, was the man who was an incredible worker in Africa, 
um, and he was the one who took the fight against the injustice of the Belgian Congo up to the King of Belgium, took it to Teddy Roosevelt. He was a passionate evangelist, missionary, and reformer. But my grandfather was actually much quieter. He was a Cambridge-educated doctor and went out to China at the end of the 19th century, survived the Boxer riots by the skin of his teeth when 2,000 Christians were killed in a few weeks. And we have incredible stories from that. We haven't time for that today. Um, he met my grandmother there. My parents were born in China, both of them. And I was born in China during World War II, as were my two brothers. So we lived in north central China with the Japanese army on one side, who'd killed 17 million, and the communist army on the other side, and the nationalist army supposedly protecting us. And we were caught in a terrible famine in 1943. Locusts, no food, five million died in three months, including my two brothers. And when my parents and I took to the road to try and find food and to escape to the west of China and get out, there were 10 million refugees on the road. Cannibalism, people selling their children for an evening meal, horrendous circumstances. And then my parents went back to what was then Nanking, Nanjing today, which was then the southern capital. By that time, I was well aware of what was going on. And as, as a seven-year-old, I was in the climax of the Chinese Revolution. So my parents lived through war, destruction, famine, death, and then revolution and the reign of terror. Uh, all with a quiet trust in the Lord. My goodness. I feel like your entire family, and I'm you know, obviously sorry for the things that happened, but I feel like your entire family has lived through and experienced uh, so much. Is there anything you know, from these experiences, anything that you personally have learned from them or something that you, you would tell people who, you know, most Christians, most uh, people in America have not lived through those circumstances. Is there anything you would say about, yeah, about those circumstances or about how God works in those circumstances? Well, mention a couple, one that's absolutely relevant to today. Uh, as a seven-year-old, I was in the Chinese Revolution the Communist Revolution of the mid-20th century, 1949. When I was at Oxford many years later as a graduate student, I had dinner one night with Sir Isaiah Berlin, the great Jewish philosopher. And it turned out he'd been a seven-year-old in the Russian Revolution, and I'd been a seven-year-old in the Chinese Revolution. And as we compared notes, this is the early 70s, mid-70s, we thank God that the English-speaking people had stood against totalitarianism, Hitler, and so on. But at that time, it was unthinkable that America would ever be touched by radical socialism, let alone by any form of Marxism, because Americanism was considered the surrogate, the alternative to all these crazy ideas. So imagine my coming to America today to see cultural Marxism, not classical, cultural, taking over so much of the American universities and now the media and politics. So that's one thing. But at a far deeper level, Troy, my parents lived through incredible times. But they were always realistic. This is life in a fallen world. And in all those years, I never saw them with anything but a quiet trust in the Lord. And my dad used to say, God is greater than all. He can be trusted in all situations. Have no fear, have faith in God. And that's never left me. We're living in chaotic times in Washington, D.C. now, but nothing compared with the times in which I grew up. But the same thing is true. While some people are demoralized and disconcerted and doubting, I say again and again, have faith in God. Have no fear. 
Amen. Wow. It, <laughs> I hope that I, I first one, I, I imagine if you are listening right now, you are thinking the same thing, listener. I feel like I'm talking to like almost like a little bit of a revive thought speaker kind of coming to life here because we hear about we go through the church history of all these different guys all the time. And we're, it's, it's just always incredible to hear just what strong faith they have and the circumstances they go through and just the way they just seem to be unshakable. And yeah, they may have moments of doubt, but it just seems that God always pulls them through. And speaking with you and hearing that story, I, I, I don't know. I just feel like I'm kind of having a conversation with one of those guys. It's very cool. Uh, as just kind of, but, oh, go ahead. Got time for one yes. story that's yes. absolutely to us? <laughs> My great-grandfather's mother. You know, 1815 in Dublin, and that was the year of the Battle of Waterloo and the defeat of Napoleon, a young Dublin councillor insulted Daniel O'Connell, the great Irish politician. The only recourse was a duel. The trouble was the councillor was a crack shot, O'Connell was a duffer with guns. But they met on a snowy day outside of Dublin, and to everyone's amazement, the councillor missed. He probably aimed wrongly so as not to kill O'Connell. And O'Connell, equally surprisingly, hit the man and killed him. Well, the man's widow in her early 20s, was left with daughter, a scandal, bankruptcy, and in terrible situation. And some years later, she went over to Scotland trying to commit suicide, thinking of committing suicide. Heard a plowboy singing and whistling hymns and was ashamed of what she was thinking of doing. Crossed the river, talked to him, went back to Dublin, came to faith. Here's the point. She met and married my great-great-grandfather, who had fought with Wellington. And her prayer from then onwards, every day, the family journals show us, she prayed for 10 or 12 generations of wow. us. Wow. And so much of the family, of the rest of the family, got incredible wealth, and it undermined their faith. Our part of the family, and Henry Grattan was her son, our part of the family has kept the faith ever since. In other words, biblically, we should think generationally. Generations are the pulse beats of humanity. Whereas in America today, and much of the West, we're so aware of each generation being so different from all the others, the boomers, the millennials, all this stuff, that they're completely cut off from the others. It's a generational thing you wouldn't understand. Hmm. It's nonsense. And I thank the Lord that the Guinness family has a great sense of generation, and much of it owing to this great woman's prayers. You know that Diderot, the great French Enlightenment thinker, said that the Enlightenment in one word was reason. And I think as Christians we say, thinking of God's faithfulness down the years, the Christian faith in one word is grace. So I'm terribly aware of the family heritage rich in faith, and God's grace. Hey, Joel here from Revive Thoughts, and I'm excited to tell you about the new version of the Logos Bible Study software, Logos 10. Nothing beats digging into the Bible for yourself. After all, there's life in the word of scripture. But if your Bible study habits have been stale or maybe non-existent, where do you even begin? The newest release from the Leaders in Digital Bible Study, Logos 10, takes you beyond Bible reading into deep studying of the scriptures. And it's good for everything. What do you want to do? Do you want to study the word more in depth, prep for a sermon, understand difficult passages, start and actually finish a Bible reading plan? Do all that and more with study tools and a huge theological library all in Logos 10. With it, you can uncover biblical insights, whether you have five minutes or five hours. And the new Logos is lightning fast on desktop, web, and mobile. It has a sleek, modern, updated look that helps you focus on what really matters, scripture. Live in the word with Logos 10. Visit logos.com forward slash thoughts to find the best Logos package for you. Science proves quality sleep is vital to your mental, emotional, and physical health. The Sleep Number 360 Smart Bed senses your movements and automatically adjusts to help keep you both effortlessly comfortable. And it's temperature balancing, so you stay cool. So you're at your best for yourself and those you care about most. Life-changing sleep, only from Sleep Number. 
It's our Black Friday sale. Save 50% on the Sleep Number 360 Limited Edition Smart Bed, plus free home delivery on all Smart Beds when you add a base. And Cyber Monday. To learn more, go to sleepnumber.com. At the Home Depot, we have Black Friday savings all through November. And with that comes a joyful holiday bustle that we just love to hear. Although we also love the sound that comes after the holidays. When people put their new tools to use. In fact, we love it so much. When you buy select Milwaukee M18 kits, you'll get an extra tool for free. So after you're done filling the air with holiday magic, you can fill it with the sounds of doing. The Home Depot. How doers get more done. The Venture X Card from Capital One gives you more of what you love, like premium travel benefits and access to Taylor Swift tickets. Oh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and ten times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. Plus, get access to Taylor Swift The Eras Tour, presented by Capital One. Maybe I'll see you there. The Venture X Card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. Peloton's best offer of the season is here. Get up to $300 off accessories when you purchase a Peloton bike, Bike Plus, or Tread. Choose from a variety of accessories, like our cycling shoes, a heart rate monitor, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. If you've been looking for a sign to join Peloton, this offer gives you everything you need to get going. This limited-time offer ends November 28th. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access membership separate. Offer starts November 14th and ends November 28th. Cannot be combined with other offers. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. Tired of long waits and rushed care at the ER and urgent care clinic? Next time, stay home and let Dispatch Health bring the power of the hospital to you. I call Dispatch Health. A care team of medical professionals actually come to your house. They're the same caliber of people that you would see if you were at a hospital or an urgent care. Dispatch Health can treat most non-life-threatening emergencies. They can do the x-rays, they can do stitches. Urinary tract infections, blood tests, urinalysis, ultrasound. It's almost everything that they can do at the ER. You never feel rushed. They're there for you and only you. I felt like their only patient. And it costs no more than a trip to urgent care because Dispatch Health is covered by most insurance, including Medicare. See if we serve your home at DispatchHealth.com. Dispatch Health really went above and beyond. It's wonderful to have care come to your home. House calls are back and they're better than ever. Learn more at DispatchHealth.com. That very powerful story, and I, that is, man, all right. I, I, I really appreciate you coming on. This was really, really, I, really, really edifying and really, really encouraging. I, I, one, I, I, will, I will be asking you when this is over. We're going to have to have you on again, maybe have one of your other uncles or grandfathers on and look at their <laughs> sermons as well to see how we can get you back. But uh, for anyone who enjoyed this interview and who's wanting to learn more about you, you write books. Can you tell them about a book that you are working on or maybe recently published that they can learn more about you and where they can find you? Well, my best-selling book by far is simply called The Call, On Meaning and Purpose in Life. But my most recent book, and it's the third in a series on freedom, is called The Magna Carta of Humanity. And it's on what I call the Sinai Revolution, how Exodus and Deuteronomy are the roots of the American Revolution. Many Americans don't know that. The notion of constitution came from Exodus, the covenant. All right. We hope that you will check him out. And next we are going to listen to a sermon uh, by Henry Grattan Guinness, who we mentioned earlier in this story. And uh, you're going to get a chance to listen to that. And we thank you so much. I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains, and have not charity, I am nothing. If we wish to take a text from which to speak to you upon Christian charity or love, we might take the first three words in the first verse of the fourteenth chapter follow after charity. But we think it better to take the entirety of the 13th chapter. For here the Apostle Paul gives you a beautiful exposition of the whole subject. 
And oh, may the Spirit of God explain it for our understanding and apply it to our souls, so that the name of Christ may be glorified. Now, the Apostle Paul had been writing to his children in Christ, the Corinthians. They had received from the Holy Spirit many gifts, and of these he speaks to them in the twelfth chapter. They had received from the Holy Spirit the gift of prophecy, the gift of speaking with tongues, and the gift of healing diseases. And now in the last verse of the twelfth chapter, Paul says to them, But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I will show you a more excellent way. In this thirteenth chapter, he shows them the more excellent way and calls them to follow after charity. I like the Welsh translation of this word, which is simply love, and the French translation, which is simply love. And the word in the original just means love. He begins by showing, in seven different ways, the superiority of charity. And in order to do this, he collects together the different gifts and graces of the Christian church and contrasts them with charity. He collects together many precious stones and pearls and diamonds and then brings out from the crown of God that jewel that burns with unearthly splendor and shows that this, which is the brightest star in his forehead, outshines and outvalues all the rest. First, he says, even if I had the gift of tongues, though I speak with the tongues of men, even if I could speak in all the different languages spoken among men throughout the world, even if I could converse equally well with the Jew in Hebrew, with the Roman in Latin, with the Ohaldi, the Elamite, the Parthian, the Scythian, men of all nations and all languages, yes and more, even if I could speak with the special power of powerful men in my own language, even if I could reason with all the clearness and accuracy of the logician, and with all the depth of the philosopher, even if I could discourse with the flow and rhythm and beauty of the orator, and with all the sweep and power and eloquence of the leader. Yes, and even more, even if I could speak with the tongues of angels, to what a height he rises here as he says, yes, though I had the eloquence of angels, whose words I heard 14 years ago, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knows. Yes, the words he heard in heaven, words which it is not lawful for man to utter. Yes, though I had the voice of that angel, who will yet descend with the trump of God and call the dead to judgment, though I could speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and even if my eloquence were an alluring eloquence, moving eloquence, persuasive eloquence, irresistible eloquence, overpowering eloquence, heavenly eloquence, angelic eloquence, but if I had not got one thing, and that one thing is of little account by the world, if I had no Christian love, I am what? A rhetorician, linguist, philosopher, an orator, poet, a logician, angel, or archangel, says Paul, I am a sounding brass. Ah, brethren, here is a comparison, as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Ah, what a laugh of derision this is, as a tinkling cymbal. What then are such gifts as these, when contrasted with love? They are less than nothing. He says, going further, If I had the gift of prophecy, if these lips of mine, like the lips of Isaiah, were touched with a burning coal from the hallowed altar of God, if I had the power to pour out prophecies in a stream of inspiration, what if with the hand, the hand of a prophet, I could draw back the dark veil which hangs over and covers the future and show mankind glimpses of the bright and beautiful above? and of the dark and terrible beneath, if I could unfold to you the dread secrets of future time and future eternity, and if I had the gift of prophecy, yes, and he adds, if I understood all mysteries, and there are mysteries in multitudes, which have never been mentioned to us, and of which we have never dreamed of knowing, as well as those of which we have heard. Why, we are mysteries to ourselves. Who can understand all these things in life? And Paul says, even if I could, what of it? Try now, for the sake of the argument, to place yourselves on the throne which Paul the Apostle occupies. Even if you understood all mysteries, who can understand the mystery of the Incarnation? How Jesus, who showed himself in the form of flesh, lived on earth, and died on the cross, was God manifested in the flesh. And Paul says, even if I fully understood that mystery, who can understand the mystery of deity? That there are three persons in the one God, equal in power, equal in wisdom and equal in glory, yet not three gods, but one. Who can understand this? But even if I did, even if I understood this mystery and all knowledge, in fact, he says, even if I knew everything, 
He goes further, even if I had all faith, not simply some faith, not faith like a grain of a mustard seed, not faith which could remove one lonely mountain, but all faith, which I could work out the most stupendous miracles and roll mountains in the depths of the sea and have not charity, I am what? A prophet? A wise man? A mighty miracle worker? I am, says Paul, I hardly know how to utter it. I am nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, man, if you had the power of an angel without an angel's love, you would be most like a devil. Now, follow Paul still further. Even if I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, surely that would be a charitable act. Alas, there's many an uncharitable charity that exists. A man might give his goods to feed the poor and become a beggar himself and all from his own selfishness. And even if I give my body to be burned, how to be burned? At the stake. What for? Why as a martyr? Oh, this makes us tremble for many of the old martyrs. You know that Roman Catholics have been burned at the stake as well as Protestants. And God knows numbers have been burned at the stake more through ignorance than knowledge and more for Satan than God. Now mark well, though I beggar myself for piety and burn as a martyr at the stake, if I have not love, all will profit me nothing. If a man had all Christian graces and all heavenly gifts and performed all good works and practiced all self-denials and suffered all painful persecutions and at the close were carried in the flaming chariot of martyrdom to the portals of paradise, if he had not love, heaven's gates would be forever barred against him. It would profit him nothing. The apostle goes on to point out the footprints of charity. But I feel, as I go on and go deeper into the subject, the utter uselessness of my speaking. So, I feel my utter uselessness as I stand up among you. I feel that I cannot affect any good with my words. But, oh, if the Spirit of God works among you, blessed fruits will follow, and you will walk in love's footsteps all your days and forevermore. Notice, then, the number of different footprints of love which Paul the Apostle discovers to us. Charity suffers long, is kind, does not envy, does not lord itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, does not seek its own, is not easily provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, it never fails. What do we have here? I believe that the Apostle Paul was always filled with thoughts of the Lord Jesus Christ and had Jesus Christ before his eyes when he drew this picture. I am sure he must have been looking, as he says, to Jesus, for this is one of the most exact and perfect portraits of Christ we have been given to us in Scripture. And it is not mere miniature, it is a full-length portrait from head to foot of Christ's character as it was manifested when he moved among men in the world. And I tell you, dear brothers, that I have only to make one little change of a word to show you this. Suppose instead of my reading the word charity, I read the word Christ. Let us then look at that passage and see if we have not his description. Christ suffered long and was kind. Christ did not envy. Christ did not vaunt himself, and he was not puffed up. Christ did not behave himself unseemly. Christ did not seek his own. Christ was not easily provoked. Christ thought no evil. Christ does not rejoice in iniquity. Christ rejoices in the truth. Christ bore all things. Christ believed all things. Christ hoped all things. Christ endured all things. Christ never failed. Christ was, was love concentrated, love consolidated. He was love exemplified, love manifested. Yes, he was love incarnate. Now I ask you, in the name of love, to follow after Christ. And I ask you, in the name of Christ, to follow after love. And if you follow one, you follow both, for love and Christ are one. Let us now, dear brothers, dwell a few moments on these words. First, charity suffers long. Christ suffered long with the coldness of his disciples with their weakness, with their unbelief and their hardness of heart. How long will I suffer you, says Jesus? How long will I bear with you? Yet still he suffered them, still he put up with them. And in addition to this being long-suffering, he was also kind to them. Now, dear brothers, have you been long-suffering? Many of you are placed into special trials in life. 
you meet with a great deal of unkindness in the household, in business, and even in the sanctuary. Oh, are you long-suffering to those who treat you so? Are you long-suffering? You say you try to be so. Now I put a question to you. Are you kind as well as long-suffering to those who are unkind to you? I am not saying you frown at those who frown at you or scoff at those who scoff at you, but I do not often give them what the world calls the cold shoulder and forget them in your prayers at the throne of God. Is this like Christ? Is this love? Now turn round and take a new course. Take coals of the fire of love, heap them on their heads, and you will melt down the ice of indifference into the streams of affection. Remember, love is kind. Charity does not envy. Now Christ did not envy. He was so poor that when they came to demand the tribute money, he had to send Peter to the seaside to fetch it from the mouth of a fish. But did he envy those who rolled in riches along the streets of Jerusalem? Oh no, Christ did not envy. And even though the foxes had holes and the birds of the air had nests, yet the Son of Man had nowhere, when his hard day's work was over, to lay his weary head. But did he envy those who slept in their palace in Jerusalem? No, he did not envy. Now do you envy? Baxter says that we are not apt so much to envy those who are above us as those who are on the same level with us. So oftentimes the physician envies the more successful physician. The lawyer envies the lawyer. The businessman, the businessman. And sadly, God knows, the minister envies the minister. But love never envies. O oh, Christians, envy is a viper that will poison all your happiness. Pluck it out of your heart and trample it beneath your feet. Remember, love will lead you to rejoice at the superior success and the prosperity and the advancement of others. Then follow it, because charity does not envy. Charity does not vaunt itself and is not puffed up. Now, Christ never vaunted himself. But you say, did he not sometimes speak of his glory? Yes, but that was not vaunting himself. Suppose that in that glass globe there burned a light. If I were to wrap around it a thin veil... Would you wonder at the light streaming through? You say, no. And when the glory of the indwelling Godhead was covered with the marred veil of the body of Jesus, do you wonder at the beams of glory that sometimes shone through? And we will vaunt ourselves when Christ never uttered one boastful thing about himself. O oh, saints and sinners, why is deity clothed with humility and the dust covers himself with pride? God forbid, pull down your pride from its pinnacle and bury it, bury it forever, bury it quickly out of sight. O oh, brothers, the heavenly Jesus humbled himself and endured cross after cross, shame after shame, until he bore the shame of shames and the cross of crosses, being put to death as a vile and guilty criminal, crucified between two thieves on Calvary. O oh, brothers, this is he who descended from the throne of God and knelt before a few poor fishermen to wash their feet. And this, that he might set in a frame of never equaled glory the loveliest picture of humility ever painted, and exalt it to the everlasting admiration of all the earth and heaven. How abominably proud many of us are, how we scorn to notice those beneath us. How enraged we feel if by chance a poor man is sitting in our pew. How often do I see you behave this way? Sometimes a minister is too busy with the effort he makes to preach to observe what is going on in his congregation. But when the whole congregation is very still and attentive, an observant minister sees the least movement anywhere. And he often sees the proud, and those who come in with a gold ring and with their best apparel, say to the man, to the poor man who comes in, as James admirably describes it, in vile clothing, you stand there, or sit here under my footstool. The aisle or the free seats are good enough for them. Why? Is it not the great difference between the rich and the poor, simply the external one, the dress, the trappings, and the appearance? Surely all of these are external, carnal, materialistic. Do you not remember that in old times Christians greeted each other with a holy kiss? And do you think the poor people merely kiss the poor, and the rich merely the rich? But now the rich man draws on his gloves and offers his finger to a poorer brother, and would not be seen noticing the very poor in the streets. Is that apostolic? Is that Christ-like? Is that what we call being clothed with humility? But the people who act like this are those who corrupt the church. Ah, lukewarm Laodiceans, beware or God will spit you out of his mouth. Oh, humble love, let me walk with you in the steps of Jesus, who did not vaunt himself and was not puffed up. 
Love, says Paul, does not behave itself unseemly. I am sure that this was the case with Christ. His words, his looks, his actions were all right, because Christ's words were words of love. Christ's looks were the looks of love, and Christ's actions were the actions of love. Oh, where is the man besides, whose words breathe such love, whose looks shine with such love, and whose actions testify to such love? There is none. But let us not despair. Let us imitate this pure, modest, angelic love that does not behave itself incorrectly. Love, says Paul, does not seek her own. In leaving heaven, Christ did not seek his own. In all his preachings, in all his prayings, in all his watchings, and in all his weepings, all his sufferings, he wished for our good and his Father's glory. He did not seek his own. And I tell you that now he has gone home to God and heaven, he still continues to seek our good. For whether you wake or sleep, eat or drink, labor or rest, live or die, Christ prays, 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 prays by day and night from age to age, and will continue until the last saint is gathered home to God, and until the last tears are wiped away from the eyes of the last morning saint. For he ever lives, not to seek his own, but to make intercession for those who come to God by him. Oh, the beauty of the love of Christ! What an amazing contrast between our conduct and his! Oh, where will we see those who are not selfish? Where will we see those who are self-forgetful? I look around me, and I find that the great moving principle that keeps this world going, whether it is trade, politics, religion, is selfishness. I have no hesitation in saying that. In trade, in politics, and in the religion of the bulk of professors, this is true. And so it is, sad, that we are the delight of devils and the grief of God. I warn you earnestly against selfishness. But there are some of you who live for nothing but self. Oh, that you do rise early and labor late, simply that you may fill yourself and collect a little of the dross of this world, and you are unaware of the crown of life held by the angel above your head. Put away your shovels. God has something better to offer you than the world has. Within your reach there are riches such as man never dreamed of. But if you turn away from heaven's open gates, the end of these things will be most miserable. If you will live a worm's life, you must die a worm's death. For selfish sinners that go groveling all their days are crushed at last under the foot of vengeance, for the end of these things is death. Love, says the Apostle Paul, is never provoked. He does not say that, for it would be false, but he says, love is not easily provoked. It was because Christ was not easily provoked that man dared to harm him. If he had slain those who mocked him, as he slew those who mocked and persecuted some of the old prophets, men might have ceased to trouble him. But he came not to destroy, but to save. And never was he provoked, even by the most aggravating insults and violent interactions, to utter a curse or strike a blow. And perhaps some of you go on in sin because he is not easily provoked against you. Is he not, you ask, the Lamb of God? But let me tell you that there is such a thing as the wrath of the Lamb, and that there is no wrath so terrible. That expression, the wrath of the Lamb, is perhaps the most black and awful one occurring in the whole scriptures from first to last. It is true, O sinner, that wrath is not easily provoked. You may go on in sin for a while. You may try to limit Christ's patience. But I tell you solemnly, that the last sin that God permits you to sin, and there is a measure known to God which you will not surpass, there is a boundary fixed beyond which you will not go. And when you have committed... I say, the last sin which God permits, then wrath will come upon you completely. Oh, it is a hard to stop the floodgates of the wrath of God, but your last sin will do it. And as sure as God made you, God will destroy you. You will die in your sins. Turn from the error of your ways. Oh, cease to provoke God to anger. And oh, take shelter under the cross of Christ, and you will not die but live, says the Lord. And now I ask you, brothers... In the name of God and by the gentleness of Jesus, not to be easily angered with each other. If it is possible, live peaceably with all men, even the most unkind, stubborn, and passionate. Remember, if God bears with that person, then you can. And more than that, return every curse with a blessing and pray for those who spitefully use and persecute you. Love, says Paul, thinks no evil. 
He means love puts the best spin on someone's actions and language and looks and on the lives of others. Where it is possible to think good of another, it thinks no evil. It does not mean to say that love never sees sin in others. Love is often more sharp-sighted than hatred. Why, Christ, who is love itself, is not blind to the sin of others. It thinks no evil. Love rejoices not in iniquity, like the devils in hell, but rejoices in the truth, like the angels in heaven. Love, says Paul, bears all things, like Christ, our sorrows. Love believes all things, every promise, prophecy, and word of truth. Love's hopes all things, yes, even hopes against hope. Love endures all things, even to martyrdom. Love never fails. It never fails. There is a rock I rest on. Do you want to know the key to the final perseverance of the saints? Here it is. Love never fails. Now, I do not mean the love in the bosom of the believer for Jesus, but the love in the bosom of Jesus Christ for the believer. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Ah, we live in the midst of constant and never-ceasing changes. There is nothing in the world that does not alter. The winds are always whirling about. Sometimes they blow from the cold north, again from the sunny south, sometimes from the bleak and bitter east, again from the warm west, ever changing. The clouds sometimes drift above us in black masses, again they float over us in white puffs, ever changing. The tides ebb and flow, the moon waxes and wanes, the stars rise and set, the seasons come and go, the days do dawn and die, ever changing. The flowers of the field grow, blossom, bloom, and blush, but when they pale and wither and droop and die, ever changing. Do not wonder then that your strength will become weakness at times, that your health will become sickness, that your life should be turned to death and your earth to heaven or hell. But, oh, love never fails. Its eye is undimmed, even though it has seen a thousand sorrows. Oh, the love of Jesus, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. On that rock, amidst these swelling seas, and drifting clouds, and rolling thunders, and raging storms, has God built his church, and the gates of hell, which mean the powers of death, will not prevail against it. O brothers, here is a haven for the storm-tossed, and a rest for the weary, the love of Jesus which never fails. And now, be unfailing in love to each other. O mother, never fail your child, even if it grieves and wounds you. Christ never fails you. O child... Never fail your parent, even if that parent forgets you. Christ never fails you. O husband, never fail your wife, even though she sins and wanders from you. For Christ never fails you. O woman, never fail your husband, even if he is unkind to you. For Christ never fails you. O pastor, never fail your people. Christ never fails you. And O people, never fail your pastor. Bear him on your hearts to the throne of grace, and in prayer there keep him before before Jehovah. For Christ never fails you. Now Paul draws the subject to a conclusion. He shows us in the last few verses how that even if all other things fail, love fails not. He says, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Mark that. He does not mean that one jot or tittle of God's prophecies will fail of fulfillment, but he means that the gift of prophecy will fail. But whether there are tongues, they will cease. Does Paul mean that there will be silence in heaven or silence in hell? Ah, no, for in heaven they will sing the song of Moses and the Lamb, and in hell there shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. He means by this, whether there is the miraculous gift of speaking with tongues, this will cease, and it has ceased. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Why won't knowledge continue? I tell you that the foolishness of God is wiser than our present knowledge. For, says Paul, it is but partial, and he confirms and illustrates this by saying, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, and we bless God that that which is perfect is coming, then that which is in part will be done away with. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Here he contrasts his knowledge on earth and his knowledge in heaven, now a child, then a man. But though this is the child Paul speaking to us, there is nothing childish in what he says, for it is the wisdom of the Most High he utters, God speaking to us by his child's lips. Ah, brothers, what children we are still! Do I not see trickling down the faces of some of you tears of sorrow? 
And why is this? Ah, you say, God has taken away from me the one I loved. I tell you, weep no more, for mark me, you will presently put away the toys and tears of childhood together. But you say, it was not a toy God took away, it was the one I loved, some tender plant, perhaps, that grew up by you and intertwined its soft tendrils round and round your heartstrings. And God saw that you did love that flower more than you did love himself, and he touched it, and it withered, and you wept. But, O oh, child of earth, weep no more. For though God will not bring you back your flower, yet you will see it again, for he will carry you to his Eden, where it blooms beneath a brighter sky, and will wipe all your tears away. When I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see as through a glass darkly, what is the meaning of this? Glass was not known in the days of the Apostle Paul. The word simply means a mirror. For now we see in a mirror darkly, or in a riddle, as some read. Now turn to the third chapter of Second Corinthians, and you will find a verse that will give you some light. He says in the 18th verse, But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. All God's glory we see at present is reflected glory. And even when we seem to behold Christ most clearly, we see only his image after all. A great mirror lies ahead of me, clear as crystal, and in it I see reflected the forms of angels most beautiful and the forms of devils. Here I see patriarchs and prophets and priests and kings and apostles and martyrs and all the 144,000 in white array. Here I see the creation and the flood and the judgment and hell and heaven, but I see it all too darkly. It is in an outline, sometimes bright, sometimes dim. But it will not be this way for long, for by and by the veil will be taken away. And looking up from the mirror, we will see all things face to face. Oh, I think that many a sermon might be preached from these words, face to face. They sparkle with a heavenly light, face to face. Thank God the veil that hides the face of Jesus will soon be drawn back. Then we will see him as he is. And then, oh, blessed be God, will he see us as he is. For we will be like him, and we will meet him face to face. For now we know in part, but then we will know even also as we are known. And now, says the Apostle Paul, winding up and drawing to a close, now there is faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Before you go, permit me to ask you, why do faith, hope, and charity of necessity abide during the present age? First, faith abides because without faith it is impossible to please God, and without pleasing God it is impossible to enter heaven. Have you faith? Have you faith? Oh, remember, he that believes will be saved, and he that believes will not be damned. Now abides hope, says Paul, and why does hope abide? Because while tossed on the stormy sea of this life, the only anchor that keeps us from drifting to darkness and death is the anchor of hope. And blessed be God, we are told by Paul that it is sure and steadfast. Perhaps many of you would be inclined to think that these two words have one and the same meaning, but here one who knows what it is to be tossed at anchor off a lee shore tell you that too dangerous a vessel is in when she lies in such a situation. When the storm is fierce and the strain great, if the anchor bends or breaks, it will come up and the vessel will drift to destruction. Or if the anchor were to remain unbroken and unbent and to drag and drag along the bottom, the vessel will likewise drift to ruin. But blessed be God, our anchor is sure. It can neither break nor bend. Our anchor is steadfast. It can neither drift nor drag. Not the mightiest wave that ever tore up the depths of the ocean can drive the Christian from his anchor. For hope, our hope, abides. But Paul adds to faith and hope charity. These three, he says. Now tell me why love abides. Why? The fact of it is that the first, second, third, fourth, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, ninth, and 10th commandments given from the smoking summit of Sinai that trembled beneath the weight of God's glory. Yes, these 10 commandments are all, every one, embodied in the 11th commandment, love. A new commandment, says Christ, I give to you, and that commandment is the law of love, therefore love abides. But the greatest of these is charity. Now, brothers, how is this? How is charity greater than faith and greater than hope? I believe for this one reason. Just because love will live when both faith and hope are dead and buried. Now, do not mistake me. I do not say that there will be no faith and no hope in heaven, but they will be very different in their nature. 
For when I see Christ face to face, I will no more care about the evidence of things not seen. I will no longer want this glass in which I see but darkly. So with hope, the sailor leaves the anchor behind when he comes on shore. But even if we will no more want this faith and this hope, yet faith and hope will be in heaven, but so transformed that you will hardly know them. For they will have wings there, and one will sing before the throne, and the other the other will gaze on into that future. But oh, this love will be there, grown from childhood to manhood, but still the same love. For the greatest of these is love. Oh, brothers, I could fancy faith and hope and charity coming for the first time to the gates of heaven. Christ has been preparing the many mansions, but they are still empty. An angel stands watching at the gates, and presently faith comes up and knocks. The angel opens the gates and says, Who are you? Says faith, Angel, it is I. Oh, faith, says the angel, there are no blind eyes, no dumb tongues, deaf ears, or dead souls in heaven. There are on earth. Go back. Open the eyes of the blind. Unstop the ears of the deaf. Loose the tongues of the dumb, and raise the dead, and guide them to this gate. But you cannot enter here. And the angel closes the gates. Another, Hope, comes up and knocks at the gates, and the angel opens them and says, Who are you? Says Hope, Angel, it is I. What do you hold in your hand, says the angel? It is my candle, says Hope. Oh, Hope, says the angel, your light would die here in heaven, as a dim candle dies at noon. For here the Lord is our everlasting light, and God our glory. But there are dark valleys of sorrow and of death on the earth. Go back. Light poor pilgrims through the darkness to this gate, but you cannot enter here. Presently love comes and knocks at the gate of heaven. The angel rolls them back and gazing, gazing with admiration on love, he says, Who are you? says love. Angel, it is I. Oh, love, says the angel. Come in, come in. You may enter here, and behold, behold your throne. It is the throne of God. And the angel closes the gates for the greatest, the greatest of these is charity. Now, in conclusion, let me bind up two arguments in two sentences, in order that you may see the superiority of love. You cannot say heaven is faith. You cannot say heaven is hope. But you can say heaven is love. Therefore, the greatest of these is charity. Now, take one more, still better. You cannot say God is faith. You cannot say God is hope. But you can say God is love. Therefore, the greatest of these is charity. Now, with overwhelming power, do these words come to your hearts and consciences. Follow after charity, that you may follow after long-suffering, kindness, humility, modesty, and gentleness, and purity, and joy, truth, and submission, faith, and hope, and endurance, and unchangeableness. Oh, follow after charity, and it will lead you up that ladder Jacob saw in dreams to glory where you will breathe the atmosphere of love and walk in the light of love and wear the crown of love and dwell with the angels of love and commune with the saints of love and speak the language of love and sing the song of love and see the lamb of love and dwell with the God of love and all forever. O sinner, the blackest sin of omission you can commit is not to love God. Stop and listen before you die in your sins. Unless the love of God is shed abroad in your heart, you perish without hope in hell. God offers to do this by his spirit for all who come to him through Christ. Hear God, O man. Hear God, O woman. As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that he turn from his wickedness and live. Turn you. Turn you. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Revive Thoughts. Today's sermon was narrated by Josiah Kerrigan. Josiah lives in Washington State and is married with four kids. He is active in student ministry at his current church and worked as a missionary overseas in Africa before that. He's also a teacher. If you enjoyed this sermon, if you enjoyed this episode, and hopefully the opportunity to listen to Dr. Oz Guinness, he actually, uh, in over 100, you know, over about around 150 episodes into the show, he is the first living relative or descendant on our show to speak a sermon, or sorry, to do an interview about their living relative. And I almost lied and said he's the first living relative, but that is not technically true. Uh, We had a recent uh, Thomas 
sorry, sorry, we had a recent Charles Spurgeon sermon that was actually spoken by Joseph Spurgeon, who is a distant relative of Charles Spurgeon's. And now we can officially say uh, we've had somebody come on to talk about their great-grandfather. We hope you enjoyed that. It's a fun part of history. Sometimes you get to actually talk to people who, you know, are in the family. That's pretty cool. And we got to learn more about who this gentleman was who did so many different things and was very influential in his time. If you enjoyed this episode, we just encourage you, ask you, share it, tell people about it, let your friends know, send them a link and say, hey, you might find this interesting or just tell them about it in person. Say, hey, there's this show called Revive Thoughts. Check it out. They had this really interesting interview, something like that. It goes a long ways. Our show grows through people telling others about it and letting them know. And our show has been growing thanks to God just putting it on people's hearts to do that. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. Peloton's best offer of the season is here. Get up to $300 off accessories when you purchase a Peloton bike, Bike Plus, or Tread. Choose from a variety of accessories, like our cycling shoes, a heart rate monitor, non-slip grip dumbbells, and more. If you've been looking for a sign to join Peloton, this offer gives you everything you need to get going. This limited time offer ends November 28th. Visit OnePeloton.com to learn more. All access membership separate. Offer starts November 14th and ends November 28th. Cannot be combined with other offers. See additional terms at OnePeloton.com. Whether it's Kroger Simple Truth Turkey or Mac and Cheese with Murray's English Cheddar or pie made with fresh Cosmic Crisp apples, there are many dishes we look forward to sharing during the holidays. And Kroger has all the fresh ingredients you need to turn today's holidays into tomorrow's memories. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Choose from a great selection of digital coupons and use them up to five times in one transaction. Check our app for details. Kroger, fresh for everyone.